Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. And my name is Jeff. And we're going to answer your questions today. But first, I have a question. Jeff, mm-hmm. how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How about cool. yourself? Cool. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I I feel like I'm getting sick. My she- wife's been sick for mm. uh, about a week. Yeah. And a few days ago, I started to notice, like, she has a cold or something. I have started to notice that, like, every morning when I wake up, my sinuses feel like a little bit more congested than the day before sure. it hasn't really gotten bad i'm hoping that it's this is as bad as it's gonna get yeah but i don't know we'll see eh. yeah I, I haven't been feeling sick but like i that I, like i didn't sleep super well last night and was tired mm-hmm. this morning but i've just been very drow- drowsy all day but that's about it yeah um so a, a few things do you remember two weeks ago i talked about the the steamer trunk that belonged to my grandpa oh, that right. i was gonna break open yes uh, so I did. Uh huh. I never did a follow up on that to let everybody know what was inside of it. Right. Ooh, as a as a big teaser. Um. So I do you have any guesses as to what was inside? I, I think mean, I, I had alluded to like somebody told me there were clothes in there or right. something. I actually I I do know what's inside. Oh, did I, I did I tell you what was inside? I, I believe so. Okay. You, you might have okay. told Steve, and I think maybe maybe I heard by proxy or something. Yeah. Maybe. Um. Uh. Well. Yeah. So I, yeah, I know, I know it's in it. Treasure. <laughs> it no, was treasure. No, it was, it, it was, was something, it was very disappointing what was inside of it. Right. Uh, I don't so, know. Like, well, I mean, I didn't physically see it, but, but go, go ahead, go ahead. Old Christmas decorations. See, that's not terror. That's interesting. I mean, how, were they really bad decorations? Were they I mean, just I'm not going to use them for anything. It's just, it was just like, I don't know. It's not I nothing. Know. I guess like, and, and thinking back, I do remember when I was very young, one of the times someone said what was inside of it. I think the word, the words Christmas decorations were thrown out. Mm -hmm. Maybe over time that evolved into clothing. I don't know. Clothing decorations. Clothing decorations. And yeah. Christmas clothing. (laughs) Um, But so looking at the stuff that's in there, it's got my dad's siblings names on it. Okay. And there is something in there that has a date, like has, has a, like a year printed on it of 1984. Mm -hmm. So it's not from like when my dad was a kid, but it was probably, um, it probably, the box probably belonged to one of my dad's siblings or maybe his, his, his parents. Mm -hmm. And then around the time I was born, they probably gave him the box. And then I don't know. Cause didn't, didn't the, um, didn't the box have like a date on it or something like the that? The box had like numbers twenty four to twenty eight on it. Is that like the like a apostrophe twenty four to apostrophe twenty eight? So I think it's the year nineteen twenty four into nineteen twenty eight. I don't know what in the world that, that could be from to, because like yeah. my grandpa was not old enough to have been in the army in nineteen twenty four. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. So I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that the chest was was that old, mm. but the stuff that was inside the chest, they probably just used it to hold Christmas decorations until. You know, around the time I was born, and then it some somehow it migrated to my parents' house. Sure, sure. So disappointing. I was at least hoping for some clothes instead. It just it, it yeah. it's just a smelly box of decorations. It, like everything. <laughs> it did, I don't know if it smells like mold or mildew or what, but it's just got that musty smell. Yeah, to it. yeah, yeah. That's sort so. of a yeah that yeah that's sort of like dry rot. Sort yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Or... So disappointing, but you know, hey, you can't all. Can't can everything be <laughs> can't all be and gold and whatnot? Yeah, can't all be treasure. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> just stacks of, of dollar bills and bonds so and stock. Bond I I even I even have a video of like I've gotten the thing open. We're about to open it for the first time. I started recording on my phone. We open it up and then oh come on! <laughs> <laughs> I should post that. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's a follow up to the steamer trunk. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, also, I I mentioned last week in last week's episode, but by the time that that episode of our podcast has gone out, this thing I'm about to mention hasn't happened yet. Okay. So I I guessed it on a podcast last week. Oh right, yeah. Um, how'd that, I, how'd that go? It went very well. It was a lot of fun. Cool. Um, I very much enjoyed it. it was uh, the podcast Nerds Without Pants? <laughs> it was a uh, it's a um video game kind of like a round table discussion sort of they have like uh every every episode they put out something on twitter and social media that's like hey what are your top three whatevers in this case it was like uh what are your video game nemesis ne- nemeses sure when i when they first told me that that's what the topic was going to be i actually i misunderstood a bit i thought it was going to be like what's a villain in a video game that the 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 protagonist is always fighting against or whatever right uh, it turns out they meant more like 
villains that, or just enemies in, in a game that even nowadays you still hate them because like uh-huh. it was, they were just so hard to beat or whatever. Right. Um, so I, I kind of got the hang of it as we were going, you know, around giving our example. So I, I came up with some, some appropriate examples, but, uh, and then, then they just do, um, various topics, whatever games you're playing and that sort of stuff. So, yeah. um, yeah, so that was a lot of fun. Also, one more thing, we had our library game of D and D today mm-hmm. and I did use Crit Academy's challenge accepted book. Yeah. The players did interrogate an NPC. Right. However, uh, they quit halfway through. The reason being they were interrogating this guy who it turned out was in fear for his family's life. And so then the players were like, well, shoot, we don't want to get this guy's family killed. So <laughs> so they just they just let him go. Oh, damn. They had to go and be lawful good. I, or I know. I know. But I'm, I'm still very glad that we had that uh, that skill challenge in front, you know, in front of me so that yeah. I could I could still have a good format for it i think it it, if i didn't have that i would have just winged something and it wouldn't have been as good sure sure uh so that was a lot of fun cool um you want to go ahead and jump into this episode yeah let's do it okay now um we're not going to have a normal dragon's horde today oh okay the reason being we have we have a few questions one of which deals heavily with a lot of examples of magic items so i figured rather than just have it be the magic item episode which I mean, that's not a bad idea for an episode, but I just figured we're about to talk about a bunch of magic items. So instead, uh, Jeff, you're you're heading to you're heading to work one day. Uh huh. You're running a bit late. OK. You do see an exit that says dragons hoard this way, but you really got to be getting to work. <laughs> so you you keep going. You get to work. You get your paycheck and you did not go to the dragons hoard. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. Well, so uh, if anybody wanted to submit Dragon's Horde items for us to discuss in future episodes or stories to the funeral pyre or questions for us to discuss, Jeff, how would they get those to us? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. That's correct. And uh, before we go any further, we do have a giveaway oh. today. Oh. We did have uh, a few people ent- enter... Uh, within the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. So we are giving away a copy of Chapel on the Cliffs, courtesy of Goblinstone. Uh, Goblinstone is a great content creator that uh, is based in the UK, I believe. And this is a great adventure. You've actually been running this adventure, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. yeah how's, that, how's that been going? Pretty good. Um, although, like the question we were discussed, uh, or I think it was a um, social media question, like how often do you want to level up? Yeah. In this group, we decided we want to level up every session okay just because we want to get to those later episodes yeah, sure. uh, those later levels but because we weren't able to get through the adventure in less than two sessions oh yeah you know like so the the players have gotten quite a bit higher level than is in anywhere near intended for the adventure so sure sure so it's been a little challenging but we're still having fun so okay cool cool well so jeff who is our winner of chapel on the cliffs this week this week's winner is dan w Whoa, 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 winner. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Yes, congratulations, Dan. Uh, you should be getting that in your email pretty soon. If you don't, be sure to let us know. And be sure to check your spam folder as well. Sometimes it gets lost in there. Um, Jeff, if anybody wanted to enter this drawing to get a copy of this wonderful adventure, how would they do so? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com with Chapel on the Cliffs in the subject line. There you go. And then uh, I also want to remind everybody that our show is brought to you by our wonderful patrons. We have a Patreon at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. It's a Patreon is a an online platform where you can pledge to donate a certain amount of money per month to the creator of your choice. If you pledge to us, we have uh, three different tiers, $1, $5, $10. We have outtakes. We've got a monthly bonus podcast. We're actually Uh-oh. about to record our monthly our bonus episode for this month. Yeah. And I am very excited about it. <laughs> it should be interesting. So, yes. Yes. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I will probably have posted on social media by now about that, assuming it goes, it all goes well. Nice. So, uh, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, we also have a monthly roll 20 game. I think by the time this episode goes out, I'm going to be trying to get that game set up for next month. Okay. Um, I have a really cool adventure that I, I picked up on, uh, on drive through RPG that I'm really excited to run. So I'm, I'm really hoping to, to get that going. Cool. 
Um, so yeah, that's once again, that's patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. If you want to help out the show and get some cool content in return, go check it out and see if there's uh, anything that appeals to you. And then one more thing, just check out the other podcasts on the Crit Nation Fellowship. Check out Crit Academy, critacademy.com. Uh, Justin, Ian, and Brandon make new and reusable content for players and DMs alike. They made that uh, challenge accepted book that mm-hmm. I used today. Uh, also check out D&D Character Lab. Garen and Dan make characters and pit them against each other to debate whose is better. And Brute Force and Ignorance is a uh, it's an actual play podcast where um, people on opposite sides of the Atlantic Ocean are playing through some adventures and having mm-hmm. a great time doing it. Yeah. So check them all out. Got some great shows on here. Speaking of shows, you want to get into our show? Yeah, let's do it. Cool. All right. So our, uh, well, we're, we're going to be dealing with uh, three questions that are all, all very similar. They're all submitted to us by Nathan H. Yep. So, so thank you very much. By email. By email. Um, so uh, Nathan asks, what are some good spells, monsters, and magic items that make interesting plot hooks around which an entire one shot or side quest can revolve? Yes. So uh, Gabe and I have come up with, uh, you know, a few different uh, spells, magic items, and monsters that we think might be interesting. Yeah. And one thing that I noticed while doing this is that, I mean, really, the answer is any of them. Right. Like anything, you can can make a a one shot or a side quest around really anything. Absolutely, yeah. um, But what I think we're going to do is we're going to say what thing we're bringing in and Mm. then give an example of like a plot hook that could be done with that or, sure. or something you know so, yeah. something so it's sort of so it's not just like oh okay uh wand of fireballs right okay uh yeah you're the the tarask right <laughs> the <know>. tarask <laughs> i mean you know like yes again anything you yeah. could really do anything like the tarask slumbering under the cities you know there that's you a, go that's a pretty, there you go that's a pretty like i feel like i've seen that uh, done a few times yeah um so which which of these do you want to do first um i mean well let's let's start with monsters because we'll bring up the tarask and everything okay. Um, so why why don't you start? So I, I do have the Tarask on my list, but it's, uh, it was as, As it was a placeholder in case, uh, in case you (laughs) had any of my other ones. Okay. So I'm actually going to start off with hags. Hags. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for anybody who's not familiar with hags, they are these like, uh, hideous old crones that they have like innate magical powers. They usually operate in, in covens. Mm -hmm. They have, um. They have, like, uh, a lot of them will change their appearance to look like, you know, a beautiful young woman or something like right, that to lure yeah. people in. And they're, uh, ki- they're kind of like the, I feel like they're like the stereotypical, like, image of a witch, yeah, sort of. Yeah, yeah like, so like a, a witch standing over a cauldron living in the woods and such. Right, yeah. Like, the they're the, like, scary stories to tell your children version of a witch, basically. Yeah. Like, you know. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, one thing that I always liked about the hags is that they can, if they're in a coven, they can craft a magic item called a hag eye, mm-hmm. which is kind of like in um, Greek myth, I think. There were like these these, oh, these three women yeah. that had this one eye between them and they would like pass it between themselves right, and such. Right, right. I mean, I, like I'm picturing them from Disney, <laughs> Disney's Hercules. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. um, I don't know. I, I always thought that that was, a, that was kind of a cool, cool little aspect of them. There's also different kinds of hags, too. Each with different uh, different specialties and such. Um, I don't know. I would say that probably I like the idea of of using hags for an adventure where maybe the party is traveling through the woods or something like that. They maybe come across like a, a friendly tribe of of women who are in need of help or something like that. And then once they've once the party's let down their defenses, then turns out that it's this this evil group of magical spellcasters that are, yeah. you know, trying to like transform the nearby village into monsters or, or right. turn them into food or something like that. Yeah. They definitely have like a lot of like, you know, like devious, you know, uh, like theming with them. Like, cause a lot of their stuff is about, I don't know, like, yeah, like because they can change their appearance and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Like, you know, it's all about like tricking people, luring people, you know, or or maybe just trying to drive people away from their, you know, their land or whatever. Sure. Like, sure. I think some, you know, most of them lives in, live in like the woods or like a swamp or something like that. Yeah. Or, you know, that sort of thing. You can make a Shrek character <laughs> stay out <laughs> sure, of my swamp. Sure. Sure. And know. just how like you can use them to be very like manipulative. Maybe there is maybe there is a nearby village and the 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 village has like been undergoing a lot of strife lately maybe because there's been a hag that has been uh influencing people to turn on each other mm-hmm. or or charming people or you know yeah. 
stuff like that. I, I like the idea of the party coming across something that they think is just a normal civil dispute, but then it turns out there's something nefarious behind it. Yeah. The, you know, the plot is to to turn the town on itself so that then the hags can, you know, treat everything as like a sacrifice to their evil god or whatever. Right, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of good stories that can be told of hags and like there are plenty of like that has plenty of fiction that involves that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um I'm it makes me think a lot of the like the Witcher. Sure. Like I've I've only played The Witcher 3 and barely at all at that. I know it's a great game. Everyone likes it. It's just it's something I haven't gotten into yet and sure. it's coming out on the switch and i'm like ooh, maybe this will be the time i actually sit down and play it because <laughs> if i can play it on the switch but then it's like it is a pretty game though so i'd rather just play it on like com- on my fancy computer yeah so anyway anyway there's there's a there's a lot of like things like that where it is like okay there's uh you know the this this village there's a witch nearby but like the village is actually like kind of likes the witch because she helps out sometimes sure but like it's not clear up front that like is she actually a witch or is she just smart you know yeah yeah uh, you know so maybe you could play that up where like it's like they have suspicions of this woman living in the woods being a, being a hag or something like that mm-hmm. and you could go to her and it's like and she's just like oh she's not a hag she's just a smart woman and people are like are people are dumb sure sure you know and so they're like well okay well if it's a smart woman who knows like potions and stuff she must be a hag or a witch or something sure and so you're like oh you feel bad for her so you kind of befriend her but then it turns out she is a hag or something like you know yeah. she could she could play on your uh you know right I, I was almost hesitant to to bring in hags actually because i don't want it to sound like Oh, women are always the, the no, villain. I, no. I, I actually, I had to look it over again because I was like, surely there are male hags, right? It's not just a female thing, right? Well, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. I, it's, it's like a, you know, I don't know. It's a, it's a. In, in like in the times when folklore yeah, exactly. of hags was created, I'm sure that there was some sort of a sexist element to that. But right. that's not, that's not what this is about. Just, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the monsters are in the, in the monster manual. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, so what's uh, what's a monster you got? So okay, so I was looking through the list, yep. and like I was looking through the list by creature type and stuff like that, and okay. then I got to the beasts. I'm like, oh, beasts are just animals. There's nothing cool about that. <laughs> but then I got, and then I thought, you know what, giant toad. Okay, because the giant toad has swallow. Yeah, what's in there? <laughs> that's oh, that's a good <laughs> so question. Like, so the so the so the adventuring party go are maybe going through a swamp that they were investigating a hag perhaps, mm-hmm. and they come across a giant toad, and they defeat it. Yeah, and from inside of it out pops who knows what. I was thinking like, um, I mean, I know I d- <laughs> you're you're gonna make fun of me, but maybe it's a warforged in there. They don't need to breathe. <sighs> He doesn't okay. need to breathe. Maybe okay. he was able to like withstand the the acid damage that they take because it's only you only take like ten acid damage per round. Yeah, and if you have some form of you know resistance to it or something like that, you know maybe they could survive in there for long enough. <laughs> I don't know, or like you know there could there could be any number of things in there. Sure, but I like I, li- I don't know I like the idea of that of somebody you know a, an, an adventuring party coming across a giant toad who has recently eaten sure. or maybe ate a while ago and just it just hasn't digested because of you know who knows what it is and like they you know they kill it and then whatever's in there is able to escape out of the out of the dead body okay okay and i don't know like i feel like that could be like a nice little surprise like like okay hey like there's there's an npc in here that has long his is very lost because you know <laughs> like he right. stumbled into the swamp got swallowed whole and then the you know and then the toad like you know, went on its way. Sure, sure. So who know? You know, or who, who knows how long it's been in there, sort of thing. Um, kind of similar to your your Warforged idea. There mm-hmm. was a an adventure in Dungeon Magazine a few years ago that um, I don't remember what the adventure actually was, but there was a point in this adventure where you can find like frozen in. The, I guess you're in like an ice palace or something. Frozen in one of the walls was a basically a warforge it wasn't actually a warforge it was a nimble right i think okay, but it was yeah. some other construct it was like this prince from this society of intelligent constructs that long ago got frozen in this wall mm-hmm. and you can free him and if you do so you know he's he's from like thousands of years ago so he doesn't really know anything helpful 
But there was a follow-up adventure they did that was, the hook was, you've saved him. Now he comes to you and he's like, hey, my kingdom, I found where my kingdom used to be. Please help me go right. investigate it and so on. Yeah. Um, but so I do like the idea of, even if it's not necessarily a war forged, but yeah. if you encounter a giant creature that can swallow things whole, what is inside of it? Right. What sort of, of plot hooks or or plot coupons or whatever could possibly be inside this thing. Yeah. Um, all right. So speaking of toads, actually, mm -hmm. uh, my next monster is Slotty. Slotty. So like the slods. Oh, slod. Slotty is, is a, the, the correct plural form of slot, slot. apparently. You're right. Yeah. Slotty. Um, so I haven't <laughs> actually. Slot I? I think it's a slotty. Slotty. Like a, um, like a freety is the plural sure. word of freet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, so slotty. Um, I haven't really used a slot in a monster in, in, in an adventure in a very long time. Yeah, uh, but I, th I they've always I've always thought they were interesting. So mm -hmm. they they are chaotic creatures, like they are from the cha the plane of limbo. I think was like the chaotic plane, right? Uh, yeah. But they they look like big anthropomorphic toads, right? Of various colors, like their color is kind of the signifier of what type of slot they are mm. and how powerful they are and what abilities they have. Yeah. Um, what always interested me, though, was that the way that they reproduce in... I guess there's actually two ways presented in the 5th edition dungeon... In the 5th edition monster manual. In 3rd edition, it was just one. It used to be just that they... Whenever they would do a claw attack on a humanoid creature, mm -hmm. their claws actually are where they keep their eggs. Yeah. So they would claw you, and the claw would leave an egg somewhere inside your body. Uh -huh. Unless, like, you did a, a heel check or something to... right inspect the wound and find out that there was a slot egg in you oh, and then a tadpole what it would it would come out of the egg and then basically burrow its way to either your heart or your brain i can't remember which i want to say brain but that feels more like uh, a it mind fits, flare. yeah but so it would get to your brain or whatever and then it would kill you and then your body would transform into hmm. a slot okay uh they, so they not, also not unlike elithids not unlike it yeah and then in the fifth edition monster manual they also say that there is a a disease that some of them carry that transforms you into a slot. Okay. So, huh. um, so I mean, I could definitely see there being adventures where somebody has been wounded and you don't know what the problem is. And then they turn into a slot. Right. And then you have to try and find out what, maybe if you, if there is a chance of turning them back, yeah. maybe you have to find the slot that created them or something. Right. Yeah. It's, it's very like body snatchers or, or yeah. the thing, right? Am I thinking uh, right? The thing kind of, yeah. Yeah. Kind of. And then, um, they present a variant uh, ab ability or whatever in the monster manual here where each slot has in their brain a gem. So like their brain, part of their oh. brain hardens and crystallizes into a gem that if yeah. you were to remove that, it wouldn't kill them. It would give you complete control over that slot. Oh. So imagine if you are looking for the slot that killed your buddy or turned your buddy into a slot in the hopes of turning them back so you can resurrect them or whatever. And then you find out that that one is actually part of like an army that's all being controlled by this one person who has all the gems, get, has all the gems or has one gem. And then that one that he, that that person controls created all the other. I don't know, hmm. but uh, yeah, just a person with this gem that gives huh. them absolute control over a creature. That's yeah, that's, I mean, heck, that's really cool. Like, yeah. I, I would, I mean, like, I don't know how you go about getting the gem out of it. Do they have regenerative, like, powers? Um, I think they do, I actually. would imagine they would have regeneration. I don't know. It sounds like something um, they'd have. Yes. Yeah. They, they do. So that's, that's why it doesn't kill them. It's because sure. they, they have regeneration. Um, yeah. So I, I, I think slot are slotty are pretty cool mm -hmm. and they even do have stats for a slot tadpole so like if Aww. if a person has a slot tadpole in them it has stats on Aww. uh on what to do <laughs> little tadpole <Aww>. yeah <laughs> i you know like i like any monster that has like extra varieties and stuff like that sure, I, sure. i'm always into it i'm like oh cool because like I, I don't know i've always been into like biology and stuff like that where like taxonomy where it's like you know, like there's so many different varieties of things and like how how did this one become different? Like, oh, maybe because like the red one is like, I don't know. I, I, I don't remember what slot. The book do. says the red one is the weakest. Sure. But we all know it's the best. <laughs> 
Gabe. Well, it's like you know, one is like, are there ele- are they ele- are they elemental? Is I don't, that their difference? I don't think so. I think it's just the different colors. There's different varieties. Right. They, they don't appear to have anything. Uh, um, anything elemental about that. Right. But, you know, it's like they adapt to different things and yeah. that's how you get like the different varieties and stuff like, like that. They even all have, they have damage, res- damage resistances to various uh, elements, but it's all the same. It's, it's the same sure. no matter what color they are. Gotcha. So huh. um, I think it's just like, you know, different CRs and such. Gotcha. Isn't there, isn't there one that's like the death slot or something like that? There is. Yeah. The death slot is the most powerful one. It right. is a uh, challenge 10. So actually not even... Not even that high. Like I, I feel like in third edition, the death slot was like a twenty or something. Yeah, I feel like they were like, en- they were like end game basically. Yeah. I don't know, but and, I mean that that's fine with me. Yeah. I like I like having lower CR iconic monsters. Then you can throw more of them at the players. Yeah, exactly. I mean, do, do they are they do they come solitary or does it say like if they're if they travel in packs or anything like that? That's a good question. The fifth edition monster manual actually doesn't have that entry in their stat block anymore. Oh, that's it used true. to be like organization yeah, yeah that's but, true uh, i don't know yeah i mean i mean if you want it to be more challenging just throw more in there you know yeah another monster i was thinking of was the uh abolith okay and i like the abolith and i know enough about it because of uh lords of madness oh yeah yeah i love that i also have abolith on my list but uh, oh do you I, okay <laughs> so so you can have that one well i mean aboliths have like that like crazy memory thing that they do i don't like they have like ancestral memory or something like that yeah yeah where it's like they they can remember things like way 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 far back so basically i think i think Since it's like the beginning of of the very first aboleth right yeah so yeah as, yeah as long as there were aboleths they all remember it you know like they just mm-hmm. kind of get their memory gets passed down yeah um and I don't know. I just like that. That alone does have like a lot of like cool potential. Like you could introduce like history that way. Okay. Or, or you know, like, um, you know, like may- maybe there's some villain. Like I'm, th- I'm thinking back to like uh, Age of Worms yeah. and uh, like Kyus. And I think he like when he first was trying to become a god was like so many you know, hundreds of years ago or something yeah. like that. You know, like something like that where it's like you're trying to learn the creation of an evil god or something like that. Or like the, you know, you're trying to find the whereabouts of this really powerful artifact. Mm -hmm. And like it was last seen thousands of years ago. Right. Who knows where it could possibly be? Well, there are creatures who remember that far back. (laughs) Yeah. So you could go on an adventure to find an abolith and somehow convince it to tell you you know, what it knows about this point in history or something. I really like that. that. So like, and they're dangerous. Yeah. They, they like have this like mucus or something. I don't, I don't know. I I don't know if I know the stats from the fifth edition. I'm I'm thinking this, I'm the one I'm thinking of is 3.5 because Lord, Lords of Madness. Yeah. But like they have like this mucus that I think can enthrall people. And like, I, I can't quite, I can't quite remember. Um, yeah, they. But I'm um, pretty sure they enslave. They enslave things. They do enslave things. I am trying to scan through the. Um, they are while underwater. They're they're covered in. They're surrounded by transformative mucus. A creature that touches the aboleth or that hits it with a melee attack within five feet uh, must make Constitution saving throw or become diseased. And when they are diseased, they can only breathe water. Oh yeah. So if you get too close to them, it's the the idea is that like now you have to stay here. Because right. if you're like you, you can't just run away from me on land. You have to stay nearby, right? So that I can continue to enthrall you. And then their thralls can live with them, even if they are land creatures, because right, they can now breathe water. So now yeah. they have to stay around the ableth. Yeah. So and then th- that alone is could be a, kind of ridiculous because like an entire like I don't know like an entire race of uh, like our entire like village of people or something like that could mm-hmm. be all like. Could be like a lost city of Atlantis situation where like <laughs> sure, sure. where everybody lo- like went into the sea and never came out. You know, it's like well because they're living down there with their abolith, you know, overlord or something like that. Yeah, you know, like so I don't like they're they're you know they're crazy fish things. Yeah, I love the idea of having to uh, having to negotiate with an abolith in order to get it to tell you what it wants, and then what sort of quest is it going to send you on right. before it'll help you? Right. Yeah. And I remember, I think it's from Lords of Madness. Uh, it mentions how aboleths have like they have like six mouths, and they so like when <laughs> when they speak their language, they're using like all of their orifices to. <laughs> 
to do different parts of the speech. Uh huh. And, um, a human, you know, you can you can take their language as a language. You can learn to understand their language, but in order to talk back in a way that will sound anything remotely like speech to them, uh-huh. like I mean, you can speak in common and they can understand common. But right. if you want to speak to them in their own tongue, you need like bagpipes and like machines and stuff to <laughs> to make the sounds. And of course, you're going to come out sounding like. Like, you know, an old 80s arcade game trying to synthesize speech. Right, yeah. So, but I love the idea of... Eat my shorts. <laughs> exactly. In order to negotiate with the Aboleth, you have to find someone that can speak to the Aboleth in its own language or it won't even give you the time of day. Right. I, when you said, like, yeah, he was using several orifices and, like, different mouths and stuff like that, it's yeah. just, like, in order to talk to an Aboleth, you need, like, five other guys. <laughs> sure, sure. Like, we all we all needed to talk in unison here, like, you know, s- speak Aboleth together. Yeah. Um, Which made me think, like, if the Aboleth has a bunch of thralls, it can, like, speak, with, I don't know, through those thralls or something. I don't That's know. really cool. You know, like... I like the idea of that. Where it's it's still speaking in Aboleth, but it's doing it through multiple, you know, multiple yeah, uh, yeah. thralls. That's so, pretty good. Like... But that's how they're able to communicate at first. Like they can't get they can't get to the Aboleth's un- underwater layer, mm-hmm. you know, uh, without going through some steps. But like on the way, they come across a group of the thralls and are able to speak through the Aboleth that way or something. Sure, so sure. I feel like they're telepathic. I think so. I, I don't know. They're I mean they're they're crazy yeah. fish monsters. Telepathy, one hundred twenty feet. Yeah. So I mean I don't, I don't know. That's crazy. Yeah. Um. So, uh, one other monster that I have is Shield Guardians. Ooh, okay. I've always, oh, yeah, Shield I've Guardian. always loved how Shield Guardians look. Um, I think they they're just of the constructs. I think they're one of my favorite visually. Yeah, yeah, they're, I, yeah, I do like the way that they're built for sure. And um, I like how they are. There's like when you create when you create an amulet, and that amulet is yes. is like whoever is wearing the amulet, that's who they are protecting. They've mm-hmm. got all these abilities that are about protecting that person. Um. This is sort. I think this is sort of inspired by. I recently watched the movie The Iron Giant. Yeah, I've seen it before. I saw it a long time ago, yeah. but uh, I saw. I watched it again mm-hmm. last week, and there's a little a thing that it can do that I think is really cool. That it sort of relates to what I'm about to say. Like if if it, the Iron Giant is this giant robot that just sort of like sh- it just crashes on Earth one day, and this little kid runs into it and has adventures with his giant robot friend. But if the robot gets damaged, for example, there's a point where I don't remember what happens, but like its arm gets like blown up or something. Then it can send out like a signal and each and every one of its parts will find it. It will will animate and then will come to the main, will come to wherever its head is, I guess. Right. And then they will all reattach themselves. And so I, when I'm thinking about the shield guardian and plot hooks, I'm thinking to myself, what if the party comes across this shield guardian and it's inactive, it's been inactive for, you know, a really, really long time, but the party knows that it once belonged to, I don't know, this powerful wizard, blah, 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 mm-hmm. a long time ago. And then they're they're maybe in the dungeon, they're trying to investigate some stuff, when the shield guardian suddenly, like, comes to life. It perks its head up, and then goes charging off, like, through a wall or something. <laughs> and then the players have to follow that, because they know that somehow that means that its creator is either alive or has come back to life or something. Right. And now it is on like an unerring journey to find and protect its, its creator. Right. But yeah, maybe the creator was like on another plane or something like that. Sure. So it sure. Had to like, de- you know, it had no, like it had no way of knowing where it was. Yeah. And, and then, was. and then maybe the party has to protect the shield guardian Ooh. and keep it from getting destroyed on the way to its destination. Right. So like, otherwise they won't be able to, like if it gets destroyed before it gets there, they won't there you go. find the, the, the wizard or whatever. So like, yeah, they have to go on a, like an escort quest. Yeah. But like the shield guardian, <laughs> like, like it takes a direct route. And so like, maybe it walks underwater and they're like, sure. Shit, sure. All right. Uh, like, what do we do now? And then I'm going to put a leash on this thing. It travels at a speed that is, Slightly faster than walking speed, but slightly uh, lower than running, running speed. Oh, <laughs> escort quests. Yep. Uh, oh, uh, WoW Classic is is Th- out. That's what I heard. Yeah, Justin from Crit Academy yeah. is all, uh, he's, he's all over that. Or rather, the queue to get into the <laughs> server for WoW Classic sure, is available. Sure. 
you know, there are like I, I saw a list of of the of the wait times. Yeah, ten hours. Oh my goodness! Like there are a couple of them were ten hour. That's wait like times. you start it up, you go work a shift at work, and then come back, and then well, oh, you only come got back, a couple more hours. Well, you come back to realize it was only uh six hours <laughs> instead you of got, wait, you got kicked out, and you got kicked out because you weren't active. You went, you went AFK. Yeah. Like it's it's ridiculous. Yeah. But yeah, well. That's that's one of the reasons why I'm not doing it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have I have one more monster I wanna I wanna I wanna I wanna put put out there is yep. the the Otiug. Okay. Yeah. Otiugs are pretty good. They're one of I think they're one of my favorite monsters. Yeah. I can they're see just, that. They're they're trash eating <laughs> like monstrosities. Sure. I, I love them, and like they have like telepathy, but it's not like direct telepathy. It's more like a suggestive like telepathy. It's like. It's like you get the feeling it's hungry, like that sure, kind of sure. thing. Like you, you know, it's not like it doesn't speak common. It speaks in feelings, kind of. Yeah. It through mostly th- hunger. Mo- mostly hunger. <laughs> yes. Um, but I'm that kind of hungry where I feel regret over something <laughs> bad that has happened. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, like an idea I've always had for an Otiug was like it. It could like coexist with. Uh, a community or something like that. Sure. Like it lives in the dump, lives in the dump or uh, like, or maybe a um, like somebody, somebody who's like in charge of like sanitation for, for a city or something like that, yeah. like has trapped an Otiug and is using it to help clean up all the garbage or something oh, like yeah, that. Yeah. And like, you know, that, that could go, that could go wrong. The Otiug could escape or something like that and cause some, cause some trouble or, you know, or maybe somebody catches wind of it and is like, heck no. Oh, that know. wind smells bad. <laughs> yeah, it would. Yes, it is. Um, or I also like the idea of like, like a farmer befriending a Otiug and like using sure. it for like, like a composting thing or something yeah, like yeah, that. Sure. I don't know exactly how like, how like. Of the specifics of an Otiug's like digestive system were. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know, like, it, does it eat garbage? And then what is it? Does it poo? Cause isn't poo just garbage? And like, that's a good question. It's like, so what, yeah, what it takes in garbage and puts out fresh water. Right. Exactly. Something. Like what, what does it produce? Yeah. So like thinking of things that do eat basically garbage mm-hmm. worms. Yeah. And they create worm castings, w- worm poop, which yeah. is very high in like nitrogen and, and other like, mm-hmm. you know, okay. it's, it's a fertilizer. Yeah. You make, you know, you mix that in your soil and you know, the plants go crazy. Yeah. Uh, so something like that where like you, you know, you can throw this Otiug a bunch of garbage and it craps out, you know, fertilizer for your crops or something like that. So sure, like it sure. could be like a, you know, a, like a, a farm that has an Otiug that it uses for it, for, you know, to, uh, to fertilize its crops or whatever. But then like, I don't know, the local village get, you know, get all mad about it. Cause like you're, it's a monster or whatever. Yeah. And you could, I don't know, try to like, you know, the players have to decide like, all right, do we take the side of the farmer. He's not hurting anybody, but this thing is a monster and could potentially cause some damage to the nearby village or whatever, or something like that. You know, yeah. I don't like, I, I, I just, I like, I like the, the crazy tentacle bastards. <laughs> sure. Here's another idea. Um, like you were saying, somebody has enslaved, or I would like to think befriended an mm-hmm. OTO. Right, exactly. And then it is living in the sewers or whatever. And then maybe one day all like the sewage gets backed up and the, Oh, that means, Something's, the Otiug isn't there. Like something's wrong with the Otiug. So you have to go, maybe it has been scared off or wounded. Uh-huh. The players have to go fight off whatever scared it or wounded it and then mm. nurse it back to health, I guess. Yeah, it's like a big pal, a big tentacly <laughs> pal. Oh, yeah. he's so cute. Uh, and it always, it like, it always brings me back to the Otiug that was polymorphed into an ogre. Yep. Yep. That I, I've mentioned From the this, Shackled City. I've mentioned this character. I'm I probably at least, I'm almost a dozen times at this point. Yeah. I love that character so much. I want I want that like if Ogre was an available playable race, <laughs> I would play an Ogre that was an OTO. I mean, term. here's here's the thing, Jeff. What's you that? can play a uh, non Ogre and have it be yeah. I w- I'm. I'm. I used to be an Otiug that got polymorphed I mean, into a, an elf or whatever. Right. I get. I guess. I or it could just be like a half work or something like yeah. that. But I, you know, like I don't. I just. I love that character so much. Where it's like, <laughs> it, like, it's like, I think it it got like disadvantage on its attacks or something like that because yeah. it was like I'm used to having tentacles. These arm things are weird. Right. <laughs> you know. I don't know. I like. You could I, be a monk. 
<laughs> oh yeah, flailing your arms around. And I mean, there is that uh, there is that um, DM skill thing uh, where it's all the monsters. Oh, as as player races, as yeah, player yeah. races. So like a you know, could, there are st- there you are could, stats for there are OTR. ways for you to do this, Jeff. And I don't even know. Oh, oh, like I always say, Otiug. I don't know if that's anywhere near how it would be pronounced. I don't. know. When I was a kid, Otiug. I pronounced it Otia. Otia. But I was not basing that off of anything. So it's like like oatmeal. Oat, oat. I guess that's just OT. I don't know. Or or uh, I think. Oat yeah is my I think is a brand of like oh oat yeah <laughs> it's like a brand of oat milk or something like that I can't remember someday we should do an episode where we do uh, <laughs> um, food brands based on <laughs> monsters and or magic items okay or something. yeah yeah <laughs> um, so yeah those were uh, those were some monsters I still have a couple other honorable mentions that I'll I'll just say the names of Rakshasa I love Rakshasas right yeah I think they're awesome yeah they could be like really depressed because of their backwards hands and you have to go <laughs> sure. and help find them help uh, I I. A long time ago, I actually ran I, at least the beginning of a campaign where one of the main NPCs was actually a Rakshasa in human disguise, mm. and he was like a he was like a, a shipping magnate or something like that. Okay. And anyway, anyway, and yeah. then also the Tarask, you know, of course you can you can do stuff with the Tarask, right, yeah. But as long as you don't have the players fight it. Yeah, exactly. That's lame. Yeah, yeah, because it's a lame monster. Um, so which one do you want to do next? We got uh, magic items and spells. Uh, let's do magic items. Okay. You want to go first this time? All right. So this was one we actually had as a uh, Dragon's Horde item. It's from the DMG. You probably have it. I think I know which one you're talking about. Go on. The Ring of Mind Shielding. Oh, that's actually not the one I have. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Go on. Well, the Ring of Mind Shielding, because we did talk about this, and specifically we talked about, like, neat, like, adventure ideas. Right. Because, like, there was a part of the Ring of Mind Shielding I never realized was a part. Is it, like, when you die, your soul goes into it or something? Yeah. Yeah. So, like... Having an item with a, somebody's trapped soul in it, and like I think it's it, it can talk to whoever's wearing it. I think yes, something like that. I think you're right. It's like you have telepathy, you know that soul has telepathy with whoever wears it next or something like that. Yeah, like that sort of that sort of crap is so like it's just like oh fine, sweet a magic <laughs> item and then you put it on and like there's an annoying voice. The voice is like hello, excuse me, <laughs> hey, oh my goodness, thank you so much. Please let me exposit the plot for this this adventure yeah something like that i mean you know it does like i don't know like the maybe maybe it keeps quiet for a while and then like the dm like slips a note and is like you hear sure, a whisper in your sure. ear it's like don't tell anybody that you hear this <laughs> you know yeah i did i did sort of something similar where i had uh a, a person living inside uh steve's bag of holding right yeah i would talk to him whenever he was <laughs> yes. because he was burrowing for a moment while he was he was like tearing through a monster's chest or something <laughs> yeah right yeah yeah it's because it was it was a gnome who, which can telepathically talk to burrowing creatures Burry- in third edition could uh, yeah or like they could speak with yeah they could speak with burrowing creatures specifically yeah, burrowing creatures real weird real weird circumstances it was, that led to that but I, it, it was like is he technically a burrowing creature <laughs> <laughs> um and I'm, I'm looking in the dmg right now and the ring of mind shielding do you know what it looks like no what I'll does it look show like you right now oh it's a brain it's a brain it's a brain yeah <laughs> oh okay it's uh it's it's a ring with a, a nasty looking brain uh-huh. sitting on top of it <laughs> yeah no R- ring of mind shielding is really good i also have a magic item that is uh one we covered on the dragon's horde okay and this is the bag of beans oh the bag of beans the bag of beans yeah the most bonkers item <laughs> in the dungeon master's guide by far and that is including the alchemy jug with its right. two gallons of mayonnaise a day the bag of beans wait 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 wait. i keep have to go back to this mayonnaise yeah. is actually on the list it is actually on the list every time i hear it i'm like no it's still it's just a running gag at this point nope. you've made this up <laughs> you've made this up at the time i thought that it's pr- oh maybe it's because like it's a you know it's a it's a chemistry thing like sure. it's, it's like emulsifying it's an emulsifier it. and blah 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 whatever uh, apparently no it's just when they were making they were when they were they were designing that item they're like hey let's get some some liquids to throw in there and someone jokingly was like mayonnaise and they all thought it was so funny they actually put it in the book <laughs> so, so they just were like yeah no it's it's totally on there yeah, other per- people other people have brought that up on Reddit and such like yeah my party uh, they sell mayonnaise every day and they've made a fortune over the course of the campaign um. But no, the bag of beans 
is the freaking most bonkers item ever. If you want to go back and listen to us talk about it in at length, I yeah. want to say it was episode sixty-two. Oh, I don't know. It was it was right before our dinner party conflict episode. It was the episode <laughs> right before that one. Okay, okay. I know because I was I was uh, telling Steve about it today, and I and I was like, hey, if you want to, if you want to hear us talk about it, go listen to this episode. Um, so it's, it's a bag that has a bunch of beans in it. You pull them out and you drop them and they, or you, you plant them and then certain things happen depending on a D100 roll. But one of them, for example, is a pyramid with a 60 foot square base bursts upward. (sighs) Inside is a sarcophagus containing a mummy Lord. The pyramid is treated as the mummy Lord's lair and its sarcophagus contains treasure of the DM's choice. There's no duration on that. Right. So you just create. A You've mummy just created Lord a dungeon with a high-level monster yeah, in it. I think it's CR 13. I hope you didn't put that in your backyard or anywhere near civilization because all those people are dead. Right, because, yeah, that's that that really messes up the, the local area. Yeah, like... Yes. That could... You could get that 12 times from one bag of beans. <laughs> that's right. Well, don't the beans regenerate per day or something uh, like that, I too? Don't, I don't think so. I think it's... You get 3D4 and then that's all. Okay. I feel like there's a way to recuperate them. Uh, I can't remember. Whatever the case. Well, yeah. 12 mummy lords <laughs> are now running your country. Right. Basically. Yeah. They they have they have formed a council. A council. Uh, yes. They, <laughs> uh, Mumra. Uh, and then there was also one of the options is an animate immobile stone statue in your likeness rises. It makes verbal threats against you. If you leave it and others come near, it describes you as the most heinous of villains and directs the newcomers to find and attack you. <laughs> if you are on the same plane of existence as the statue, it knows where you are. The statue becomes inanimate after 24 hours. Either of those. The party stumbles across, oh, we're in the middle of this deserted city and there is a, a sar- there's a, a pyramid with a sarcophagus and a mummy, lo- mummy lord in it. Uh-huh. What happened? Or... You're in town and, oh, hey, look, there's this statue. It's real angry at somebody. Let's go investigate <laughs> like, what's going what's on. Going on. Uh, now I'm thinking, like, what if you use, like, stone to flesh on uh, on that statue? See, now I'm imagining that it's it's not that it turns into a person. It turns into a human-shaped lump of flesh <laughs> that is now crying out in pain. <laughs> and blaming and, you. And blaming two people now. Right. <laughs> Oh. oh, that's horrifying. Oh, my goodness. Or it takes off running in the direction of the person who, who created it. Right. Just but to, in, just in to... doing so, like, its 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 feet get, like, rubbed off on the stones below it as oh. it's running. It just turns into a pile of goop as it, oh. it keeps scrambling. When its, its legs are Gabe. gone, it's pulling itself <laughs> along eventually. Like, it's just a head rolling. Uh, okay. Just slinging insults I mean, it's not, it like, gory. It's just... F- a Fleshy? giant lump of flesh. I, don't know, I feel. I feel like. I don't know. I feel like the the f- stone to flesh is stone to flesh uh, the, in fifth yeah, edition. That's the thing. Okay. I feel like that just doesn't that just bring a statue to life? Basically, I don't think so. I don't know. Maybe we'll get to that when we get to the the spell section. Sure. I don't know. So speaking of bags, okay, bag of devouring. Okay, I thought about bringing that one, but I didn't. I I like the bag of devouring. Yeah, I like it because it gave me mechanics. For something escaping out of a bag of holding. Okay. I like that. Because like there is like it will, it basically can eat a, eat a, eat a person. Yeah. And then like, I don't know. I feel like either they take damage or they eventually get like just destroyed or something like that. I can't Mm -hmm. remember exactly, but there's like, there's like a a DC 10 strength check or something to like bust out of it or something like that. Yeah. Um, but it has this thing where like you can, you can put mundane stuff into it. And then, like, after a certain amount of time that it disappears. Yeah. But the mechanics are it disappears to another plane or something like sure, that. Sure, sure. And, like, that's up to the DM and stuff like that. So, like, you know, it's, sort of, it's just, like, lost items sort of thing, you know? Like, yeah. You know, like, the this bag of devouring you've been putting, like, stuff into that you just want to get rid of. Yeah. You know, using it as, like, a compost, like, a trash compactor or something like that. It's like, oh, we, we, like, oh this is dangerous magical item we should get rid of it you're just throwing in the bag of devouring you know out out of sight out of mind (laughs) yeah and then you you know you find out that like that that item comes back in a really bad way or something like that or like sure or maybe you that thing you threw away you're like oh shoot that's actually the key to to oh you have to go find it you have to go find it so it's like okay Okay. well i gotta get myself 
you know, swallowed by this bag of devouring. <laughs> Hopefully it takes me somewhere that's bre- breathable, you know. Yeah. I, and I, I really like that. Having to get yourself eaten by a bag of devouring is a great plot hook. Yeah. So, like, who knows where you end up? <laughs> or um, it's just like a form of travel, maybe. Um, <laughs> oh, the, um, uh, 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 Lost Room, The Ticket. Okay. Yeah. So like it like the ticket brings you to a very like the ticket like is this anyone I, that touches it gets teleported to a very specific location. It is a very specific location. It, it's just like in front of. Is it at the motel? No, it's uh, it's, it's just on, a bus. It's stop. just on a road in Gallup, New Mexico. I think it was a bus stop originally, but it's not anymore. Right. Yeah. So like it was just like you would just end up in front of this diner or something yeah. like that. Yeah. It, like it's just the middle of nowhere. Like so like anybody who touches it. Like it's sh- shunt off to this place. And so like the, that's where the bag of devourer leads you is just so, sort of like a middle of nowhere kind of spot. Sure. Where there's like, you kind of get stranded and you're like, well, what do I do now? Like, yeah. You don't know where I am. There's nothing around to tell me where I am. I could maybe die here. Sure. I like the description. The very first part of the description of the bag of devouring. It is this bag superficially resembles a bag of holding, but is a feeding orifice for a gigantic extra dimensional creature. <laughs> like, Oh boy! Right. Well, that's I a, don't even want to. I don't even want to picture what that creature is. You don't want to unpack that. Oh, oh good job. Good like job. Bag. My my only issue with the bag of holding is that it's in the magic item section instead of the cursed item section. It used to be. In, it used to be in the cursed <laughs> item section, and because of this, so many like RPG discussion forums that I've been in. Uh huh. Everybody just at, there, there are so many times where people are like, yeah, so uh, my party got a bag of devouring, you know, and they did they did this and this and this. And it's like so often people are like, yeah, we got a bag of devouring. And I'm like, how often are you finding bags of devouring? Why is this something that people are just like, oh, yeah, yeah, my group has one, too. It, it used to be like this because it's not something you would purposely want. Right. I guess people will always find ways to use something bad right in in a way that benefits them but sure. it's it's just in my opinion it really takes away from the the interesting qualities of this thing if like oh yeah it's a bag of devouring they're all over the place i got like 12 of them in the back yeah you know i don't, I don't know, know. Hmm. so i like the idea of it I don't, I don't like what it has what the culture around it has become i guess similar sure. to the bag of holding i don't like how <laughs> so much focus has been shifted away from ah, it's a bag to oh yeah it is a a portable nuclear device that right. if you touch it the wrong way will kill everybody around it. anyway, yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no i don't want to don't want to complain too much about that so the next item that i have this was actually steve's suggestion was the immovable rod right so by itself it's a real simple item you know it's a little rod you click a button and then it becomes it floats wherever you left it it is very very difficult to move not mm-hmm. literally immovable right but very, very difficult to move. Yeah. Um, this isn't how it works, but there is an episode of the Hardy Dice Friends where they were they were proposing that what if when you click it and it stays in place, it stays at exactly the same point in space even when the planet does not. Right. And so their idea was <laughs> that like every year this thing is just out there in space and you have to, everybody has to like be aware that wherever you are might become the the place of wrath for the the immovable rod because this thing will just from your perspective fly across the landscape tearing through buildings and such <laughs> and then like there's a group of adventurers that every year they get together and they're going to like chase at they're going to fly after it as fast as they can just to hit that freaking button and deactivate right it. yeah that's not how it works right that's not how it works and that's not but... how planets work anyway uh, right right there's so many things wrong right. with with but it, that with is that. that is i mean like in your D and D setting, sure, the sun is stationary in yep. space, and the planet that you're on, that the material plane is on, is is just know, in a per- exactly perfect uh, orbit. Ro- orbit every yeah. you know every year, right? If if that is the case, then sure, that's a funny yeah. that's that's a funny <laughs> the, funny thing to to use that for, right? <laughs> um, um, I like the idea of it. Maybe they could even be that uh, another plot hook is that the there's like a floating palace or something mm. and, or maybe it's like the bad guy's lair. And then they find out that the whole thing is literally held up by one immovable rod <laughs> or, or a network Sever- of immovable several rods of them, yeah. or something. Yeah. Cause like, I mean the, the it has a specific amount that mm, it can carry. Yeah. Like I think it's like 8,000 pounds or sure, something like that. Sure. So, but like, yeah, like several of them. So like, you know, the roof 
just has a bunch like the the the, the, <laughs> yeah. um, the ceiling just has a bunch of movable rods on it and it's yeah. just holding up a building i like that <laughs> and so like if you're trying to take down this fortress <laughs> you just had to deactivate one of them and it just sort of starts crumbling <laughs> <Sure. laughs> it just you you deactivate one of them and the, the whole fortress kind of leans a little bit <laughs> right it's like you get that like like that zoom out wide angle shot of like <laughs> yeah so yeah pretty simple but i right I, I like it. Uh, what else to add? Oh, um, the perioptive health. Okay. Just because, like, it it makes you immune to diseases and stuff like that, but if you already have a disease, it suppresses it. Sure. So, I don't know. Some some NPC could be, like, have, like, some, like, terrible disease or something like that, mm-hmm. and they use this amulet to keep themselves alive and healthy, but it gets stolen or something like sure. that. So, like, it's it's... Like it was one of those items that when we proposed, like if for uh, if you'd a, have it in real life, if you could have an item in real life, yeah. a magic item in real life, what would you do? That's like a really good one because it's like, hey, immune to disease. I'm only mm-hmm. gonna ever die of old age or murder, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that little thing. Oh, oh, you know that that thing. But I no mean, need to think about. Like that. you don't have to worry. Like you don't have to worry about health and sh- like uh, you know. Well, uh, well, anyway, I won't, I won't yeah, get into yeah. actual <laughs> the actual mechanics of real life health insurance. But anyway, you don't have to worry about going to the doctor or whatever. Yeah. So like that's like okay that's that'd be really nice to have. So that's that's a thing that could be you know very important to a very specific person mm-hmm. or maybe somebody is using it to suppress like a disease that like can be like devastating. Oh sure yeah. Um th- patient 0 has it and if they ever lose it a zombie apocalypse will yeah. sweep the world. Right. Or um the disease that makes you only able to breathe water from the oh, shoot. Yeah. I mean that you could maybe suppress that, you know, it's like, ah, great. I've been swimming through this cavern for, for months and I finally found the path. Ah, <laughs> 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 you did drown by putting on the amulet. <laughs> yep. Oops. Uh, so I don't know. Like, it's just, I feel like, I don't know. It, it, it's, it, it could, it could be, it could be, it could be, it could be done. I don't, I don't know. Sure. There could be some. like there's, there could be a person who they've lost it, and if they don't get it back very soon, they are going to die. Right. Or, or like we said with the zombie outbreak or whatever, something very, this horrible disease mm-hmm. will get out unless someone can get them this periapto. Right. Yeah. And so, like you, I mean, as a DM, you come up with some crazy diseases that you can have being suppressed by, sure, you know, sure. by this, by this amulet or something. Yeah. So, imagine this, Jeff. Uh huh. Your party is. Uh, You've been been contracted to go and investigate. There's this like this desert town, off you know off in the off in the with this like city out in the desert that used to be very very prosperous. Nobody's heard anything from them in months, maybe years. Uh-huh. Like they've just kind of disappeared off the face of the earth. Uh, they usually would people would come and go from there all the time. Nobody's heard anything from them. So you go out there, you go out looking in the desert, but you find out that well wait this isn't a desert. This is like a this is like a sea. There's like an ocean or something out yeah. here that isn't on any of the maps. There's supposed to be a city out here. What happened? And then so you get all your like uh, your your water. Bre- you get that friendly Aboleth to help you breathe <laughs> in water. Right. You go down there and then you find a city like miles underwater. Maybe not miles underwater, but like, like under thousands of feet underwater. And then you find out that it's someone had a decanter of endless water. <laughs> and they left it they on. They left it on. <laughs> They forgot the 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 one person that knew the the command word. Right, like lost something, his, something he, fell on them and crushed them or something. Well, he they, he lost his uh, amulet of uh, perioptive health. <laughs> there and, you go. You know, died of a there disease. There you go. And so as a result, this thing's maybe it's been going on like the geyser right. uh, function for months. Right. And so yeah, it just kind of filled up the the, yeah. the surrounding area. And and heck, maybe it's there's a time constraint. Like if if you don't solve this soon, like this C is going to going to get over this like mountain and then it's going right. to flood the entire yeah the city was in a city ba- on the other side the city was like in a canyon or a basin or there something like that that is yeah. the, like once it gets over a certain part, it'll start flooding some other area yeah yeah like yeah kind of like that <laughs> or or uh there's a gentleman who has been selling uh his world famous apple juice for a very long time <laughs> he's got a great <laughs> recipe but then someone starts putting him out of business oh no and you need to go investigate who is doing this and how they're making such huge quantities of apple juice so frequently. <laughs> like he doesn't, there, there aren't even any apple trees around the, the first guy, the guy who hired you is the only person with any apple trees. <laughs> but then you find out it's because he has a decanter of endless apple juice. <laughs> 
which was your your augmented uh, decanter of endless water. But I, th- yes. I think with just like prestidigitation, you could flavor uh, things. No, it's just Jay just let me have a decanter of endless okay. apple juice instead of water because I because I was an artificer, so I made it right slightly different. I mean, but because uh, like the way uh, the way I thought it was like you just added a little extra magic, like you just, oh yeah, maybe maybe. So like the spells that you use to create the the item, sure. You know, you were just like, and press to digitation to make it flavored, you know, like apple juice. Yeah. So, you know, but yeah. They were or dig- I cast a variant good berry and good, <laughs> good apple. Good apple. As part of the cast, <laughs> as part of the creation of the yeah. item. Mm, that's good apple. There you go. Okay. Um, We've been, we've been at this for a little while, but we yep. still got, um, you still got to- some spells. I, I do have uh, just a quick mention. I had uh, Trident of Fish Command and Iron Flask as some okay. uh, some. Trying to uh, fish command okay. as, as some some honorable mentions because yeah. you know trying to fish command like you can talk to to fish yeah. and then the iron flask has demons inside of it. <laughs> demons Good. have been trapped inside this flask. Oh no! Maybe one of the demons wants out and wants you to help it or something. The trying to fish command makes me think of there was a dragon swords item a while back that was like a monkey rod or something like that. Oh yeah, and you can, can like it's, it w- summon monkeys or something. Yeah, I think like if you used up all those charges, it would potentially create a mountain of bananas on yes. top of you and then it would like attract all monkeys within a hundred miles yes, or something ridiculous yes. i loved that <laughs> item so much yeah that's a good one yes um but uh uh spells yeah spells so uh so the first spell i have is nystol's magic aura okay so it is a spell that uh it lets you you can cast it on on an object or a person it then gives them a false magic aura or hides a magic aura. Oh, yeah. It lets them do various things. You could cast on a magic item and make it seem like it is a different magic item. Mm. You can make it seem like it is a non-magical item. Or you could make a non-magical item seem like a magic item. So, like, let's say you have a stick. You could cast Nice Soul's magic aura on it so that it has a magical aura of a specific item. You could be like, yeah, there's a wand of fireballs. Don't use it. You might blow something up. Right. And then you could sell it to somebody at a discount because they can't test it out. But hey, look, it, you know, Detect Magic shows it as a wand of fireballs. So then you give it to them, you take their money, and then you run away. And then it turns out they just have a regular stick. Also, you could cast it on someone so that uh, if there is a magic item that only functions for the High Priest of Bane or something, mm-hmm. you can cast Nice Soul's Magic Aura on the person so that they, the magic item treats them as if they are the High Priest of Bane. Okay. So um, I think that it could very well be that maybe someone has found a mag- like a legendary magic item that can only be wielded by a legendary hero. Yeah, and they're using the item, so everybody thinks they're the ma- they're the legendary hero. But it turns out, no, they just fooled it by using Nysol's magic aura. Sure, or something like that. Yeah, or somebody has been sold a quote unquote wand of fireballs or whatever, mm. and then it turns out it's just a regular stick. And they've been going <laughs> around to every town selling magic items, but they're just ordinary things. Right. And then the party has to track them down and just stop like a, them. There's like a wand of dancing lights, and they're like, these are the weakest fireballs ever. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> um, the one, one, I, one spell I came across when I was uh, looking up, like, building, like, a necromancer. Okay. Cure wounds. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. Pretty good necromancer spell. Yep, it's great necromancer spell. <laughs> makes for really good uh, adventuring. All right, join us next week. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's actually magic jar. Okay, magic jar is pretty good. It's like it's ridiculous. Like you 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 put your soul in a jar. Yeah. What? <laughs> well, so I don't. Is it that you you put it in a physical jar, or is it treating a body like it is a jar? No, it's um, uh, uh, like you use a gem, a crystal, or some sort of container. Okay, okay. So it does have to. It is some yeah. sort of like a, a container or something. Yeah. So yeah, the mater- material component it has to be worth five hundred GP, but it has to be some sort of container or a gem or a crystal or something reliquary, mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. Um, and it's like. Uh, I'm just going to kind of read from it actually right now. Your body falls into a catatonic state as your soul leaves it and enters the container you use for the spell's material component. It's range self. So you put it, you're doing this to yourself. Okay. Um, and like, you can't move. You re- like you're in a jar. Yeah. But it allows you to like possess people. Yeah. And then like you, they, their soul goes in the jar and you, your soul goes into okay. their body. Okay. So like, like that's I don't like you could you could be possessing things and like changing bodies or something. I don't know, yeah, it's a real weird spell. I it's been a long time since I've used it. And I'm always confusing it with uh, soul bind, right? 
which is also you put a soul in a gem, but it's not you put your souls. You put the enemy's soul in the gem. Right. Is that does that one let you like control them or something too? I don't think so. I th- I think it just like they cannot they are trapped forever unless someone can find and destroy that gem. Right. There. I think there's like very specific conditions in order to free them or something Some, like something that. like that. So so with magic jar, I'm always confusing the two, and I'm always I I always I. I have to always remind myself, Magic Jar is the one that lets you possess people. But then I'm always unclear on where does the jar come into this? <laughs> it's just the jar is the the container it's, that you're Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's not that you're swapping souls with them because their soul isn't going in your body. Right. They're, your soul is going in their body and their soul is going into this jar. Right. Your body is just chilling. I think, yeah, I think I think that's the case. Yeah. W- uh, you're... Game statistics are replaced by the statistics of the creature that you retain your alignment, intelligence, wisdom, charisma. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, and they're, like, there's some rules in here, like, like the ways that, like, this can backfire and kill you. Yeah. Like, if the container's broken or something, I think you just die or something like that. Oh, okay. And, okay. like, you can you can return to the jar or return to your body or something like that. I sure. can't remember. Or maybe I think it's, like, if the thing is destroyed away from your original body, it, your soul doesn't go back into it and then yeah. you die. I. I don't know. It's it. It's a. It's one of the longer spells. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I just like anything with like possession and like a jar with a soul in it. Like that's <laughs> sure. Like you come across a jar with a soul in it, and it's not the. It's not the necromancer's soul. It's yeah. The soul of yeah. you know the body that the necromancer is in, and you're like, oh my goodness, that's the president or something. I don't know. <laughs> sure. Like, you know, you you find a, the jar with the soul of the king, and you re, and like in the like oh, you, yeah, you yeah. start you realize like oh okay the king isn't actually the king because the king's right here right you know yeah yeah that could that could lead to a to a twist like yeah you find this catatonic body and a jar with the king's soul in it but the king is signing that treaty right now <laughs> oh no <laughs> no we have to <laughs> like we we have to warn them yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I just that I just remember coming across that while looking up necromancer stuff, and I was like, "Ooh, that's cool." So um, another spell that I have on here is uh, flesh to stone. We sort of talked about it earlier. Um, well, sort of. I mean, like stone we, we talked about something something related, which I will actually be looking up right now. But flesh <laughs> to stone, you know, I think it's a very very simple idea for a, a plot hook where the party finds a statue, uh-huh. and then through some means they manage to find out that the statue is actually a person that Mm -hmm. has been turned to stone and then they depetrify the person and now like oh my goodness thousands of years have passed please help me find right my descendants and you know put this all to to rest or something it was in uh baldur's gate uh the baldur's gate game you come across a statue and like you're able to like there's a there's like a vendor or something that like sells a flesh just or a stone to flesh uh scroll yeah that you could be like oh this this is neat. That's really expensive. Like, what the heck would I use it on? And it's like, oh, there's a statue in this town. Try using a statue. Sure, sure. It ends up being like a cleric that that can join your team, but she's like from like long ago or something. Yeah, I just realized uh, Stone to Flesh is not in the player's handbook. I thought maybe um, that might be a thing. Then where is Stone to Flesh from? I don't know. It was definitely a spell in earlier editions. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. Well, I guess, if there were a stone to flesh spell, I guess, how would it work? Right. Tell us your thoughts. Yeah. Because I guess like if it's like flesh to stone, you, you have your hit with flesh to stone, you like hit it with like a. You, well, I know in third edition you could remove curse. Or there, something. there was break enchantment because the thing is flesh to stone is a it, it was at the time a an instantaneous spell. It wasn't permanent because a permanent spell could be broken with dispel magic it was instantaneous which means that there isn't even any magic there anymore yeah so because it was instantaneous the magic has come and gone so there wasn't anything to dispel the person is no longer there now there is a statue so you had to have there was a special spell that specifically ended effects like that right so anyway i guess uh, i don't know i guess flesh of stone works a little differently than it used to but again you can use Mm. What, whatever means it takes to to depetrify somebody, um, you could use that to depetrify someone and then and then find out uh, yep. what it is, what their whole deal is. Um, I did have one one uh, last uh, spell yeah. on my list, which was Tree Stride. Okay, Tree Stride's cool. And I say Tree Stride because like there, like we had this idea a while back. I think our first oh, fifth edition yeah. adventure. I know where you're going with this. We're like it's so like in fifth edition they have this like trinket. Like thing when you when you're creating a character, there's like yeah. this like 
if you want to, you can give yourself a trinket, right? Which, which is just a weird object. It's such on your a weird, person. weird thing to take up two pages, <laughs> like, yeah. like on the in the player's handbook. I like the flavor of it. I but, do too, you know. but like I don't know. Like it's just something that like nothing's gone. Like there's really nothing more to it other than just like a little added bonus flavor. Mm-hmm. And like I always found myself rolling on it and be like, that's not interesting. And then rolling and rolling and rolling until I realized like I could just pick the thing. Yeah, you, I find. you're allowed to just pick one if you want. Or just right? make up one, you yeah. know, like it's it's sort of like, a OK, whatever. But I think I I think I was rolling and rolling and figured out like I was I was playing a, a paladin that was going to become a druid or something. Yeah. And I get, got one that was like a seed. That won't like it's like a petrified seed or something like that, or yeah. a seed that won't but that won't sprout or something yep. like that. And I was like, okay, wouldn't it be cool if like he was able like through like persistence basically and like magic and stuff was able to like kind of get this seed to sprout? Yeah, and then it ends up being like a very rare type of tree that if you tree strided through it, you would end up in this like secret grove of Druid of like a Druid circle or something like that. Sure. Sure. So like, I like the idea of like, of a like tree stride being used on like, a like I was like, they're like, you're in a forest that's mostly like pine, but then there's one birch tree sure, or something. Sure. You're like, Oh, okay. And like you tree stride in that birch tree and it like takes, takes you, you to a specific place that you can't get to otherwise. Exactly. It's yeah. Like, no, I think that's really cool. That like, was, yeah. When you came up with that, that was a great idea. Yeah. So like, I don't know. So I think tree strides are pretty fun. I'm pretty sure tree stride is fairly short distance, but I mean, eh. if for a plot thing, sure, sure. you could stretch it like, you know, this specific type of tree is a very magical type of tree and it allows you to go miles instead. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Um, so the last spell, I've got a couple honorable mentions, of course, but uh, the last spell that I have is Imprisonment. Mm-hmm. It's a ninth level spell yeah. that uh, has various ways of trapping someone forever, <laughs> essentially. You can bury someone, you can entomb someone in like a sphere of magical force way below the earth. Right. So like you can just hide them away somewhere deep down underground forever. Mm-hmm. You can... Um, and. Nothing can pass through the sphere, nor can planar travel get to them or get get them away. Right. You can chain them with heavy magical chains that hold them in place wherever you want. Again, forever. Uh, hedged prison, which is a tiny demi plane where like it's like a maze or something, and every time they like go down one way, they just come out the other side. Sure. Like, like in Pac Man or something. Uh-huh. And uh, so like no matter where they, they're free to move around, but nothing can get them out of there right um minimus containment where you shrink them down to one inch and imprison them inside a gemstone or similar object sure uh or you can uh make them fall asleep and they can't be awoken forever oh and like you know there there are various ways of dispelling this spell but like it's very you have to have like a ninth level uh dispel magic spell and in that case you have to either be at the place they're imprisoned and or holding an object that like belonged to the caster or something. It's a really, really interesting spell Yeah, for one of those like epic level imprisoning and, you know, a, a God or a, an angel or something somewhere. Right. So I, I've always liked that spell. Yeah. And like, I, yeah, that's a really cool idea. Like to come across, to come across something that has been imprisoned. Yeah. And like, I don't know. I'm thinking of like, you just come up, you, you're like, somehow digging through the earth or something like you're burrowing mm-hmm. in the air. You're in the underdark or something like that. And you start burrowing down deeper and you find somebody in this sphere and they're like, Oh, hello. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, just find somebody in magical chains and they can't move. I really like the chains one. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, Hey, do whatever you want, but people have been trying to break these chains for centuries and they're not, they're not breaking. Right. So I like, how, that's, I mean, that's cool. That's definitely yeah. cool. Yeah. So I like that one. Um, do you have any others? Uh, no, that was, that was, that was about it. Okay. I've also got just a couple honorable mentions. Uh, simulacrum. Sure. I think is a great spell. You create a clone of yourself. Yeah. What if you come across, there's like, uh, uh, a complex that's full of clones that have been making clone. Like there are so many clones that they've been made, been making clones for like hundreds of years. None of them even remember why they were originally there. They just know that every now and then more clones show up. Uh huh. Um, uh, it makes me think of uh, Fallout, Fallout Three. Yeah, yeah. Gary. Yep. Gary. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Wish, I think, is is the obvious one. Sure. You can, you know, of yeah, course, I you mean, can build a, a campaign around Wish. Yeah. 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 So, cool. Yeah. So, so those are those are the ones we came up with. I think uh, 
we had some some cool mm-hmm. some cool stuff in there. And then we're gonna be doing something a little bit different with our social media question for for this coming week. It's basically gonna be, hey listeners, what do you guys got? Right. What are some uh, spells, monsters, and magic items that you can think of yep. that uh, would make good plot hooks. Yep. So uh, we do still have our last week's question, though. Mm-hmm. So we'll uh, we'll get to that. Last week's social media question was, what is the coolest environment you've encountered in game? And we only got, we we really only got a few answers to this. So I think, I think we'll get through it pretty quick because we're getting a bit up on time here. Uh, do you recall what you said if you had an answer? Mm, I can't quite remember. I think I, I do remember really liking the the place where Kios became a god yeah, or whatever. Yeah. That, that that like temple or whatever. Like sure. That sort of was like a very eerie and like dangerous situation. Yeah, so it, it, was, was it was definitely really neat, uh, really neat dungeon. Yeah. And then I think I said there was uh, an island that we came across in when I was playing with uh um when I was playing as as Saythorn and Saris, the Right chronic s block characters yep um where the island was like it was like split into four sections and each one was like governed by like a like a demigod of some aspect of something or other and we had to like challenge each of them to to get (laughs) through it uh so over on facebook andrew h says my dungeon master opened a portal to the astral plane of his homebrew we walked through and found ourselves on the moon oh so that's interesting neat um Maybe slight spoilers, but that makes me think of the ending to Portal 2. Oh, right. I absolutely love that game. Yeah, that, yeah. That, the ending oh, is very, very cool. Oh, that game. Yes. Uh, all, that's all we got on Facebook over on Reddit. Zero Zero Jiminy Cricket says, A fantasy shoots and ladders type of tower. Traps and secret passages led to shoots or ladders. <laughs> I really like that. That's really good. I feel like that would be really confusing, but in a good way. Right. If you if you could do it, it'd be a lot of work to make it make sense. Right, yeah. But I like it. Over on Twitter, that's Carl with a K says, the far north. Definitely coolest up there. Oh. But um okay. Get okay. I, <laughs> I I gotcha. I gotcha. And then uh, on Discord, Noah says, Neverwinter Nights. Eighth layer of hell, frozen wastes of Cana. It was so cool there. The cool did damage to us. Okay. All right, guys. Hey, <laughs> but I think that could also be let's an just cool it with the puns. Okay. Let's chill out. All right. <sighs> this is all making me freeze up. <sighs> all right. Uh, so Jason says the castle where we were caught between the giants defending it and the dragons attacking it in Age of Worms. Mm. Similarly, in Age of Worms. Uh, Debrasaur says the realm destroying capital ship within the void between the planes. Ooh, Ooh geez. Um, Floofy Shub says there is a stairway to heaven, but there's also a stairway to hell. <laughs> it is a spiral staircase. It has a banister. We have slid down the banister to hell. <laughs> is that a reference to something or is that just? I don't know, but. <laughs> I guess I'll take it. And uh, the beverage tea says the group I play with sticks religiously to forgotten realms so much so that when I ran an altered version of last minds of Fendelver, they wanted to know how long after Drizzt it took place. So the coolest setting that I have played is in Barovia. Mm. So that, uh, that'll do it for our questions for this week. Uh, once again, the social media question for next week is the three topics we covered. You know, what are some magic items, spells and monsters that you think are, Right. Uh, so pr- would provide some good plot hooks. We already went over those two, uh, two sure. at great, great length. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's your answer for it? <laughs> there you go. Um, so uh, before we close out, let's uh, let's take a moment. Let's take a deep breath. <sighs> let's uh, remember the monsters who have uh, been killed, the spells that have been cast, and the magic items that have been used by those who have come before us Mm -hmm. as we toss another log onto the funeral pyre. This week's funeral pyre story comes from our patron Edward T. via email. Long ago, there was a gnome whose name is lost to history that defied all odds and became a knight of the chalice paladin. Even though paladins require massive strength He persevered through his frail and tiny body, but on his first mission, a monster with tentacles reached down from the ceiling and snapped his body in half. Oh, no. Not every story is about overcoming odds. (laughs) So let's raise a glass in memory of the uh, the 
the gnome paladin with the forgotten name that reminds us all, don't get broken up about these sort of things. <laughs> Clink. Clink. All right, that'll do it for today. To submit questions for us to discuss, items for the Dragon's Horde, or stories for the Funeral Pyre, please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. For show notes, links to media mentioned on the show, and running lists of questions and magic items, go to interpartyconflict.com. Join the discussion on social media. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash interpartyconflict, on Reddit at r slash interpartyconflict, on our interparty Discord, or on Twitter at InPartyConflict for our weekly social media questions. Your answers might end up on the show. Find us on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, anywhere you download podcasts. Please rate, review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you'd like to support the show, check out the rewards at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. There's a few different tiers, so anything you can spare, even a dollar a month, would go towards making the show better, and you'll get bonus content for it. Jeff, tell us about FriendQuest. FriendQuest is our YouTube channel where we play video games. Yes. Speaking of video games, check out my side project, the Arcade Memories Podcast. If you'd like to submit your own childhood memories of going to the arcade, record them or write them to me at arcadememoriespodcast at gmail.com. Also, head over to bit.ly slash interpartyconflict to take a short survey about our show. What you like, what you don't like, etc. And just for taking it, you'll get two free printable board games courtesy of Mary and Tom over at hollandspiel.com. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, until next time, I'm gonna get some apple juice. <laughs> Me too. Me too.